Chapter 4, The Respiratory System. I'm going to alter the pronunciation of that word just a little bit from American English to British English to try to help you remember how to spell it because in our American pronunciation, we leave out some critical letters that will cause you to misspell the word. So in British English, one would say the respiratory system. I suggest you use that in your mind just to help you remember how to uh, spell the word once you are required to spell it. Um, it is true that in American English, we say the respiratory system, and that's perfectly acceptable. But if you think respiratory was you're trying to spell it, it will help you remember how to spell it correctly. So I'm having some difficulty with my next slide here. Give me just a moment. There we go. It's a little off center and I'm not going to center it up because it's the only one that's centered or off centered like this. So we'll just use this slide for what it is. Uh, the really all you need to know from this slide is that the respiratory system is divided into two tracts. We have an upper respiratory tract and that includes the nose, the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea, and the lower respiratory tract, which, include, which includes the bronchi, alveoli, and lungs. We're going to get to all those words, so you'll get a chance to work with those today. And just a mo another moment here to get things to cooperate for me. That one slide is problematic for whatever reason. Um, we're also going to be looking at the medical terms versus the common terms that we use. So... Uh, if we look at this list here, you see the medical term on the left and the common term on the right. And don't worry about getting all these right now because we're going to cover these a couple times in this presentation. So pharynx is our medical term for throat. Larynx is our medical term for the voice box. Trachea is our medical term for the windpipe. And thorax is our medical term for chest. And you've already heard that one a few times, so we're going to be using it in this chapter. What is the function of the respiratory system? Well, it's mainly to exchange gases between the environmental air and the blood. And that is most commonly, in fact, exclusively oxygen and CO2. The process of gas exchange between the atmosphere and the body cells is called respiration, hence respiratory. So this is called respiration. And that's what we're talking about on this slide. A complete respiration is one breath in and one breath out. Those of you doing nursing and medical assisting and other sorts of patient assessment, when you're assessing someone just in general, you're going to be looking at that, um, that respiration rate. Um, especially in the era, era of COVID, um, everyone's looking at respiratory rates when they're, someone's being checked in or when they're going through the medical system because, of course, we're keeping a, being observant <clears throat> for signs and symptoms of that particular disorder. So respiration, or the act of breathing, uh, consists of two steps. Inhalation, the act of breathing in. Exhalation, the act of breathing out. You can see in the diagram here, you can see the arch of the muscle and the diaphragm. You see how the diaphragm lowers during inhalation, which allows extra volume in the lungs and allows the, air to, the lungs uh, to fill with air. And exhalation, you'll see that muscle, as it relaxes, it rises and it pushes up. And that's the figure on the right. Exhalation, of course, is letting that CO2 out. We bring oxygen into our lungs, and CO2 is the uh, gas that we get rid of when we breathe out. And here they are. I just mentioned them. So the gases involved in respiration are oxygen, which is abbreviated O2. This is, consists of inhaled air into the lungs. And carbon dioxide, and its abbreviation or its chemical sign, is CO2. And this is what's exhaled out of the lungs. We also have a bit of diffusion that goes on in the lungs at the side of the alveoli. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but you can see here in this diagram, the hemoglobin molecule is, has come to the lungs and is passing through the capillary beds. It picks up an oxygen molecule, an O2, and it drops off a CO2 for your body to get rid of. And so that's the gas exchange involved in breathing. Once again, we're going to get into that in a little bit greater detail. And once you get to anatomy and physiology, you'll go into this in great detail. But we'll, we'll hit the high points in this lecture. First word I'm going to throw at you, no combining form that we're going to work with here. It's simply auscultation. This is listening to the sounds produced within the body using a stethoscope. Um, I've, I've done this many times, listening to chest sounds in patients, and as well as getting blood pressures from patients as a medical assistant. We don't do much of this in um, radiology, but nursing, medical assisting, 
um, general clinical applications for um, for patient evaluation will involve typically some type of auscultation. There's a couple of them here. On the left, we see a doctor, presumably, or maybe a um, uh, maybe a respiratory therapist listening to someone's lung fields. And on the right, we see a blood pressure being taken. Those of you who are interested in medical assisting and nursing, I just want to point out in this picture on the right, there is nothing in this picture that resembles a correct blood pressure. These are two models in a studio that have no idea how to handle the equipment or put it on. So it's a nice reference. You can see auscultation taking place there. It is highly inaccurate when it comes to the process of taking a blood pressure. Here's our first suffix. We had this one before uh, in our general suffix terms at the beginning of the semester. Um, Nia is how this is pronounced, although I like to say penia because it has the P there. Of course, the P may or may not be pronounced depending on the word, as in tachypnea. That uh, describes fast breathing. Or bradypnea, which describes slow breathing. Dyspnea is difficult or painful breathing. We see a lot of that, of course, during the cold and flu season. It's a word we use a lot. Dyspnea is a very commonly used word. Eupnea means normal breathing. Orthopnea is difficulty breathing except when sitting or standing up straight. This is indicative of usually of congestive heart failure. Someone who has orthopnea um, probably has, in fact, very likely has a heart condition that does not allow them to lie down. When they lie down, they can't breathe and could literally, in some cases, suffocate. Um, so in these cases, uh, it's very possible and likely that the patient even has to sit while sleeping, or at least be semi-reclined while sleeping in order that they can still get a full breath. That's orthopnea. That's nothing you ever want to have or nothing you ever want to see your patients have. And apnea means without breathing. Um, just to cover the first two words here, tachypnea and bradypnea, when we talk about fast breathing or slow breathing, the normal rate for an adult human is somewhere between 12 and 20 breaths a moment, depending on activity. So when we say 20, 12 to 20 breaths per minute, we're talking about a sitting in a calm environment. If you just came off the treadmill, that's not going to apply. So these terms are relative to the condition the patient's in. But generally speaking, that's what we measure it by. If it's more than 20 beats, it's uh, tachypnea, or pardon me, if it's more than 20 breaths per minute, it's tachypnea. If it's less than 12 breaths per minute, we call it bradypnea. Now, we're going to go back to apnea without breathing. Some of you have heard of this word before, and maybe in the form of sleep, uh, sleep apnea, which is a phenomenon that causes one to stop sleeping um, in, the, in their sleep. Uh, when I was first introduced to this concept, I thought it was a bunch of hooey. <laughs> to be honest with you, I didn't buy into it. Um, I witnessed several patients who went through stages of sleep apnea that suffered critical medical and irreversible, I should say, critical and irreversible medical damage to their uh, parts of their nervous system, parts of the brain, and other parts of the body that were affected by the lack of oxygen, specifically the optic nerve. So sleep apnea is to be taken seriously. It's usually treated with something called a CPAP, which is an acronym that means continuous positive airway pressure. This is the most common and effective non-surgical treatment for sleep apnea. It's applied through, the face, uh, through a nasal or facial mask, and it keeps the airway passages open during sleep, which is sort of true. What it really does is it forces oxygen all the time, and it, in those moments when, when the patient is asleep and they might be inclined to stop breathing or their brain tells them they don't need to breathe in that moment, this will still force air and it causes the respiratory system to respond and breathe normally, thus keeping oxygen levels consistent. Our body needs oxygen to process just about everything and also to produce energy. And without oxygen, there is no life. And so this machine will help that oxygen go. It will help those depleted levels and ideally will keep the patient safe from any pathology resulting from sleep apnea. So let's talk about some upper respiratory tract terms right now. So when we talk about the upper respiratory tract, we're talking about the nose, the pharynx, their larynx, and the trachea. And guess what? We've got special words for each one of those. Let's jump in and see what we have. Oh, well, we'll start with the specialty first. Didn't see that coming. Um, otorhinolaryngologist. You can try that three times if you want. Otorhinolaryngologist is an ENT, meaning ear, nose, and throat. And after this lecture, you'll look at this word and you'll break it down and say, wow, it really literally means ear, nose, and throat. 
They are physicians that specialize in ear, nose, and throat diseases, also known as an ENT. We have a great practice in Santa Cruz called SCENT. So the acronym spells SENT and Dr. Seftel's practice. And uh, it's a great, uh, great practice to go to if you need an ENT. I know at PAMF and Kaiser as well, we have very good and strong ENT departments. Okay, first combining form, we're going to start with the nose, since that's kind of the, the beginning of the respiratory tract. Naso is our first combining form, describing nose. Nasal, once again, there's a pertaining to suffix, pertaining to the nose. And nasogastric means pertaining to the nose and the stomach. Uh, there is a connection between the nose and stomach that we sometimes use. Maybe you've heard of an NG tube. It's uh, used sometimes when a patient uh, is maybe intubated. That's one situation. Or they have something that causes them to not be able to swallow. Uh, let's say they've had, let's say they've had their tongue removed as a result of cancer. I've seen that more than a couple of times, including within a family member. Uh, a nasogastric tube is how that person would get nutrition to the stomach. They insert the tube up through the nose, descends down to the back of the throat, where they get it into the esophagus and down to the stomach. Not something you want to have done, but very useful if it's necessary. So that's why we have a term that combines the stomach with the nose, nasogastric. Rhino is also a combining form for nose, and it makes me think of rhinoceros. And if you think of a rhinoceros, they have that great big horn out in front of them. And so it makes me, that's how I, that's the correlation I use to remember that rhino means nose. Rhinitis would be inflammation of the nose. That would accompany a common cold. Also accompanying a common cold would be rhinorrhea. And that is discharge from the nose. In other words, a runny nose. And, of course, there's rhinoplasty, which is surgical repair of the nose. So that is, once again, when we say surgical, uh, anything about surgical repair of the nose, people tend to think it's a um, plastic surgery, and it is a type of plastic surgery. And they also think it's elective, one's choosing to change it. However, there are uh, medical indications. I've seen plenty of people hit the steering wheel of a car uh, with a high velocity and causing a lot of damage and rhinoplasty was necessary to restructure it so it would look like a normal nose again. So it's not always elective. It's not always, well, it is always plastic surgery, but it's not always elective. Sometimes it's absolutely medically and clinically indicated. Okay, we've hit our uh, 12 minute, 35 second margin, which means I'm gonna pause here. I'll be back with some more words in just a moment. 